absolutely fascinated with poblano chilies. There's just so many things you can make with this ingredient. However, the poblano chili has to be coaxed for it to really bring out all of its virtues. I'm gonna show you how to do that. You have the poblanos just like this, and there are many ways in which you can roast or char them. One of them, and the most traditional and ancient, actually, is to just roast them directly on top of a flame. You can do that on the stovetop, so as they char and roast, you start flipping them. If you don't feel comfortable using the direct flame, you can just put them on a baking sheet and stick them under the broiler. You can also char them on top of a heated comal or skillet. And I love doing this because the chiles start reacting. And the best part of it is the smell. It is so incredibly delicious. I want to bottle it into a perfume. That's what I want to do. You really want to burn the skin on the outside. Think of s'mores. You want to char the outside, but you want the inside to have been transformed, but you don't want the inside to have burned. The same thing with the poblanos. You can see the skin starts wrinkling. And then right after you do that, you have to put your chiles inside of a plastic bag. It can be any kind of plastic bag, but you have to immediately close it because now you've created a steam bath. Do you see all the steam? After it steams for like 10 to 15 minutes, what happens is you can remove the skin just like that. Super easy. You've unwrapped the flavors of the poblano chile, and the taste is so deliciously Mexican. You open it up, and under a thin stream of water, you rinse it and you remove the seeds. And then you end up with chilies that look like this. Once you have the poblano chile roasted, you can do a gazillion, million things with it. You can use them to make soups, or salads, and of course, chile rellenos. But another thing I like to do with my chile poblanos is to make rajas in vinegar, because then that is something else that I can use for many things. So I begin with a whole onion that I have, then thinly sliced. So I'm gonna add about a half a cup of olive oil. I have these over medium heat, counting tablespoons in my head. Add the onion. Whoa! And then I'm gonna slice three cloves of garlic, thin slices. I'm gonna add the garlic. Once the garlic becomes a little bit fragrant, I'm gonna add my spices. Three dry bay leaves, ten whole black peppercorns. Then I'm gonna add a teaspoon of oregano and thyme. Five whole cloves a half a teaspoon brown sugar, one tablespoon of salt. I'm gonna mix that up. So now I'm gonna add a half a cup of rice vinegar, but I'm using natural rice vinegar, not seasoned. And I like to combine it with white distilled vinegar. So a half a cup of each. And now you want these vinegars to boil. So I'm raising the heat and let these reduce. Meanwhile, I'm gonna cut my roasted poblanos into rajas. I'm just gonna add all of the rajas in here. Some of the vinegar evaporated. Oh, my mouth is watering because I love these flavor combinations so much. I like to put them in a jar and then I keep the jar in the fridge because these are delicious, cold too. If you sell stuff and you wanna start bottling these thing, you'll sell. I'm giving away my recipe. You can use it for tacos, for quesadillas, to top a salad, oh, a fajita salad. But you know what I'm gonna use these for right now? For a tuna melt, because today, we're all about sandwiches, and I love a good tuna melt. I have two cans of tuna. I'm gonna add two tablespoons of mayo, one tablespoon of freshly squeezed lime juice. 
Then I'm gonna season with salt and pepper. I'm gonna mash this up. The very first time I ate a tuna melt, because they're not common in Mexico, was the first time I came to Washington DC. One of my sisters, Lisa, was living here in Washington at the time. She started making the tuna salad, she topped it, she added the cheese, and I didn't want to be rude, but I was thinking, what is she doing? And then <laughs> I remember the first bite and it was so yummy. That's when cultures clash and you realize you like something from the other culture, but now you're gonna like something from my culture in your tuna milk. So James doesn't like tuna milk. He's been telling me since we started today that he doesn't like fish and cheese together. James, will you try mine? I'll try yours. Oh, promise? Promise. And he's smiling too. <laughs> okay. I have two slices of rye bread that I already toasted. I'm adding the tuna. And then look at these. The rajas. It's gonna be that pickled, exuberant layer under the melted cheese. Mm. I have thick slices of monster cheese. And I'm gonna put this under the broiler for just a couple of minutes, just until the cheese melts. Ready, James? Yeah, yum. Mmm. But it sounds crunchy in the bottom. And you can see how, where the tuna is sitting, it started to get a little bit moist and mushy. And then you see the layer of pickled poblanos and the monster cheese. It's so deliciously melted and bubbly on top and yum. The poblanos are giving it a fabulous layer of not only flavor, the crunch. They're so crunchy. The tuna is so delicious with everything on top. It's just so good. James. <laughs> You've tuna melted my heart. I have to tell you about another hugely important moment in my life. What you're looking at is video from my very first cooking class at the Mexican Cultural Institute in Washington, D.C. This is kind of where this whole TV thing all started for me. Look, we even called it Mexican Table on the very first tape. I'm going to Mexico in December and I'm used to smuggling lots of ingredients. <laughs> Looking at this now, all I can think is, what was I thinking? What made me think I could get up in front of a room full of people and teach them about cooking? I think you can hear the nerves in my voice. Dried chilies are a main ingredient in Mexican cooking. And we Calm down, Patty. Don't burn anything. In Mexico, we have no taco salads. No, 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 no. But I do know what got me up there. I love my culture. I love the food of my home country. And I wanted everyone in that room to love it all just as much as I did. I'm still doing that today. So now I'm gonna make some sopes. But first, I'm gonna make a quick roasted salsita to drizzle on those sopes. And I have a pound of tomatillos, which I husked and rinsed two jalapeños, a thick slice of white onion, and just one garlic clove with the skin on. I'm gonna put these in the oven for about eight to 10 minutes until they're charred and mushy. Now I'm gonna make sopes. I have two cups of masa harina, or corn masa flour, which you can buy at the stores, and I have two cups of lukewarm water, or just water at room temperature. I'm gonna first add one and a half cups of water. So sopes is the very first thing that I made for my very first cooking class. When I started the culinary program at the Mexican Cultural Institute, 
the director had invited me to put together a program, I was really nervous because I thought that I was going to teach to maybe eight or ten people. And it turned out the director really wanted a live big class for like a hundred people. And I had never spoken in front of a big audience like that before. So you know what I did? For three months before I put the boys to sleep at night, instead of telling them bedtime stories, I would practice my class. I'm adding a little bit more water because you really want the masa to be very moist. You have to feel it. It has to be like Play-Doh. And I'm going to cover it with a kitchen towel so that it doesn't dry out. It dries out really fast. I'm going to make balls of about two inches in diameter. And then you're going to put it in your tortilla press. You put one piece of plastic in the bottom and one on the top. And then you're going to put your ball right in between. And I'm going to press down until I get about a quarter inch of thickness. It's like a minute per side. You know when to flip a sope or a tortilla when you can actually flip it, when it doesn't stick to the pan like pancakes. When they have browned on both sides before being completely cooked, you take them out and using a clean kitchen towel or a napkin, you go around the rim and you pinch. Then you add them there for another minute to finish cooking in this shape. They're nice and thick. I'm gonna put them in this tortilla holder, which will keep them nice and warm. It's gonna keep them warm until I'm ready to eat them. The tomatillos are about to burst. They're so charred and super mushy. The roasted onion. I'm gonna remove the stems from the chiles. I'm adding a half a teaspoon salt and a half a cup cilantro. And I'm just going to coarsely chop it. I'm gonna peel the garlic. I'm gonna puree, but I'm not gonna puree until smooth. I want it chunky and rustic. And I'm gonna taste for heat. Mmm. Mmm. It's definitely spicy enough. Okay, so now you can see why I decided to make this, because this is so much fun. You have the little sopes, which are irresistible. I have my refried beans, lettuce and onion some salsita, and some queso cotija, which is just an aged Mexican cheese. Super crumbly and salty, and a little bit tangy. I mean, it's a party. Mm. So we have the masa. You can taste like the brown parts in the bottom and at the top. And then the refried beans that are so flavorful. You get the fresh crunch from the white onion. And, you know, the lettuce is so welcoming. This simple little recipe, you know, the sopes, they say so much about Mexican cuisine. You're tasting the earthy, sort of nurturing base, which is the sope. The salsita has the tomatillo roasted flavor. It has a little bit of a kick. And this was my way to make an introduction to my Mexican home. <laughs> I really connected with Big Shell. We're both women chefs. We both have this unbridled passion for what we're doing. And she also has three kids, but hers are triplets. Big Shell takes me to the outdoor kitchen that she runs with her family where she's going to prepare a very special dish. In Tlaxiaco, we have a stories, mm -hmm. we have a history, mm -hmm. we have a events. 
and we have maybe the most traditional dish of Lajiaco. It's called mole con picadillo. We so, make uh, three recipes. Three recipes for this mole. Picadillo, una salsa agridulce, y el mole. And, the mole. and now, special. being a busy mother of three, how often do you make a meal like this? All women have to find the time, no? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Ixchel begins by coating her pot with lard. Then, she builds a base layer of tomato, tomatillo, almonds, raisins, and onions, along with garlic, sugar, and salt. This is the first layer. Okay. Okay? You have to put another layer. Okay. This is the one chile mole. Yes. So that's unique because many chiles in you, Oaxaca use a yes. combination of yes. chiles. Ixchel deep fries all of the mole ingredients in the same oil where all of the many flavors begin to mix. When you finish with the chile, we continue with the nuts. And when you finish the nuts, we continue with the fruits. And then we finally fry the tomato. I've never seen such a complex mole in my life. It even had chorizo pureed into the sauce. Todo esto lo vamos a mandar al molino mm -hmm. para que se pueda hacer la pasta de mole. Where did you learn this recipe? Doña Lucha was my teacher. She died. Oh, she was died. she from Slajiaco? Slajiaco. El de most traditional woman. Ixchel next begins to deep fry the picadillo mix that is made of boiled lamb's heart liver and lungs. So when you told me that Lajiaco was a commercial meeting point, I mean, it's like right here. Exactly. So you're tasting the mix of immigrant waves and centuries in one really, really Baroque dish. So no, this no, no. is homemade Oaxacan-style chocolate. Tell me, there's cacao. Cacao. Mm -hmm. and cinnamon. Cinnamon, sugar, mm -hmm. and a little bit of eggs yolks. Egg yolks. So, and it makes it, oh, it thickens it. So these are all the ingredients that you deep fried in lard and can, you ground. Can you see the color? Yes! Chorizo and chocolate together, that's insane. Eso quiere decir que nada está dicho en la cocina mexicana. The spiciness, the richness, and the smokiness of the chorizo together with the chocolate is just incredible. Vamos a probar la salsa de dulce. Mmm. You could practically make a meal out of each separate thing. Este plato no lo vas a encontrar en toda la República Mexicana como mm -hmm. tú lo dices. No lo encontrarás porque es un resumen de toda nuestra historia. Gracias, Ixchel. No sabes, de verdad. I love spending time with Ixchel. Every time I learn about what goes into making a certain dish, you get so much more joy out of eating it. Voy a servir 20 platos. <laughs> Pero come conmigo. Pero Quiero ver cómo gracias. te lo comes tú. I'm constantly reminded of how many different regional cuisines there are in Mexico. If you think about it, there's all these little pockets. Even a tiny little town like Lajiaco has its own really strong culinary identity. And I have so much fun when I travel to places bringing those themes that I taste into my kitchen. Right now, I'm gonna make an agridulce sauce to go with the halibut. It's simple, it's delicious, and it has very few ingredients. 